pastor. He's awesome, isn't he? Come on, everybody. <laughs> no. Miss middle school students, go with Pastor Jim. And uh, we got class for you guys this morning. Um, this morning, I want to talk to you about something that's been stirring around in our hearts. And um, how many know it's always good to preach from where you're at, right? And, and stuff that's going on. Everything that we do here at Fuel Church is done in a very practical way. And we really want people to be able to get not only information. How many know information is okay? But how many know revelation is a whole lot better? And so that's where we really want to come from, from all of this. And um, there's, a, there's a saying that the world has, and it's, it's, uh, the, the saying is, seeing is what? Believing. believing. And so I'm going to challenge that this morning in regards to that seeing is believing, and challenge that in regards to is really seeing believing. And so first of all, I'm going to bring up some pictures here. And uh, on these pictures, we're going to look at what you see versus what I see. And uh, they're going to be coming up here in just a second. Here we are. So here's the first one. So how, what do you guys see? Some people see a face. Some people see an Eskimo. Okay. Next one. What do you guys see? Two faces or a cup? Okay. Next one. This is always the famous one. What do you see? <laughs> okay. They're supposed to be blue and gold and, and white and gold, and people see different things. So here's the reality. Let's go to, let's go to 2 Corinthians 5, 7. 2 Corinthians 5, 7. Paul's sharing. He says, For we walk by faith and not by sight. Yet that many of us actually do walk by sight rather than by faith. Have you ever experienced that in your own life? Where you actually is what you see is what you believe. And I'm going to challenge that several different ways this morning. And, and many of us are, are like Thomas. So many, how many know that Thomas gets a bad rap? Doubting Thomas, right? Everybody goes, oh, doubting Thomas. Oh, that guy. Remember that guy, doubting Thomas? Right? And everybody is, 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 how many know his name wasn't Doubting Thomas? How many know his name was really Thomas? Right? And we have nicknamed him Doubting Thomas, but the reality is that, that how many know that many of us do exactly what Thomas does? In other words, Thomas, he says here he, in verse uh, John 20, 25, he says, he replied, I won't believe, because the other disciples came running in and say, man, we just saw Jesus, we just saw Jesus, man, it was amazing. And and, and Thomas says this, he says, they told him, uh, we've seen the Lord. But he replied, I won't believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands and I put my fingers in them. How, that's just kind of disgusting. But anyway, and place my hand on the wound in his side. And many of us have that type of faith, don't we? When I finally get it, I'll believe it. How many know that that type of faith typically won't get you very far, very long? And, but Jesus then later says, Jesus appeared to him, and Jesus was such a, he, he just loved Thomas. And he's like, Thomas, come on over here. Go ahead. Put your fingers in there. Go ahead. Place your hand on my side, right? And then, he, then Jesus says this in verse 29. He says, then Jesus told him, you believe because you have seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing. Blessed are those who who believe without seeing. I don't know about you, but that sometimes can be a pretty tricky deal. Sometimes it can be something, it's so funny, when, when you are stirred in your own self and you know what God has spoken to you, how many know that God oftentimes speaks stuff to us that other people aren't supposed to do? Are you listening? I mean, oftentimes what ends up happening is, for instance, Marie and I have the story, we got married and when we got married, uh, she was on birth control pills. And every morning, she would wake up on these birth control pills sicker than a dog. Every morning. And, I'm, and I've got to a place where I was just like, That's, this is just absolutely ridiculous, right? So one morning, I said, where are those pills at? And she got the pills, and we grabbed the pills. And I said, give me those things. And I took those pills, and I threw them in the trash. And I said, we're done with this. Let's pray. There was something that stirred on the inside of me, right, that God was stirring on the inside of me going, we're done with this, and we're just going to live by faith. 
If we're supposed to have a kid now, we're going to have a kid now. If we're not supposed to have a kid now, we're not going to have a kid now. So we prayed, and we believed God, and we said, Lord, we leave it up, leave it up to you. Our life is in your hands. Here we go. Okay? Five years later, we didn't have any kids. Okay? And how many know then at that point, we started getting concerned? We're like, this is just kind of crazy. We should be having kids. And so we went to doctors and all this other kind of stuff, and we both got checked out, and everything checked out A-OK, checked out fine. And we went to this one doctor who was a, who was a, a believer, and he, and he goes, so he goes, everything's fine. He goes, you need to go home and have babies. And I'm like, well, that's a lot easier said than done, right? We've been trying that, and it hasn't worked at this point. And he goes, well, have you, had your, have you been and had the um, elders at your church lay hands on you? And I said, well, no, but I've been in prayer lines. I've been, I've been in, we've been in every prayer line you can imagine, having people lay hands on us. And like, he goes, no. The question was, have you had the elders at your church lay, anoint you with oil and lay hands on you? And then we're like, well, no, we haven't done that. He goes, well, that's what the scripture says, so why don't you go do that? And so I'm like, great idea, <laughs> right? So <laughs> we've been doing everything else, right? So we go to the elders of the church. They lay hands on us. They anoint us with oil. They pray over us. And within how long was it? Three months, she was pregnant. So we tell that story. So we're elated, hearing God's voice, right? We're elated of what's going on here. So we've shared that story with others. How many know that others have tried to do what God told us to do, and on their honeymoon, they got pregnant? Do you see what I'm saying? You can't. Your faith, right, what God speaks to you is what God speaks to you. Now, how many know that God speaks to you through scriptures too? And there's some very specific things in scriptures. If we do these things and we mandate, we do the things that he's asked us to do in scripture, then those things come to pass as well. But there's other things that are more personalized to us, like having babies, right, that he's like, do this. How many know, he, Sarah, same thing, right? Open her womb, boom, her womb is open, right? All these kind of things were going... It, I, I cannot speak my faith and have you guys exercise my faith. Does that make sense? You have to exercise your faith. And you have to exercise what God has spoken to you. How many think that is an awesome thing? God actually wants to have communication with you. How many know that's awesome? God actually loves you. It's not just some guy. It's not just some person over here. That guy's specially anointed. Have, listen, God loves you. He is no respecter of persons. And he desires to do great and exceedingly awesome things in your life just as much. And so I want us to get this down deep inside that we're not living the Thomas style of faith. But that we are actually living a faith that is a scene without believing. So let's be reminded again. We've been talking about this over the last few weeks about faith. So let's be reminded again what faith is. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Faith is the confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. It gives us assurance about things we cannot see. And we talked about this, how it's a picture, a picture of a person who is completely committed to maintaining his position. He will stay under a heavy load as long as it is necessary for him to achieve his victory. He's intent on standing by his commitment. Regardless of the cost, he must pay. Nothing can sway or move him to change his mind. He is not going to relinquish his territory. That's faith. Faith is being confident. Faith is standing firm. Faith is not moving. Faith is just going, no, I know what God has told me. I know what the word has said says about me and says about my situation. Therefore, I am not going to relinquish. I'm going to stand here for good. So what is believing? Believing is, belief is exercised faith. I love that. Belief is exercised faith. In other words, if I say I believe in something, right? How many know that many people around say that they believe in things, but they don't ever exercise upon that belief? Would you agree? I've always told you that story about that guy walking across Niagara Falls, right? He's got the wheelbarrow. And then with the wheelbarrow, he walks across with this tightrope thing across Niagara Falls. Everybody's cheering on the other side. He gets a wheelbarrow, and he puts it on the tightrope, and he walks across with the wheelbarrow, and everybody's cheering on the other side. 
And then he says, how many of you believe that I could actually walk across this tightrope with this wheelbarrow with a person inside? And everybody's cheering until he says, which one of you is going to get in the wheelbarrow? Because that is what true belief is. Who was willing to get inside the wheelbarrow to walk across the tightrope across Niagara Falls? And that's what true belief is. How many of us are actually going to get in the wheelbarrow of what we believe about God and who he is and who he says he is? And that's what our challenge is here in Western Christianity is that we have this challenge of actually getting in the wheelbarrow. We could talk about it all day long. We'll even go to church and we'll even check that nice little box. But true belief goes beyond that. How many of you know that? True belief actually begins to start to expressing your faith to those that are around you. Yeah, but I might get in trouble. But true belief says it doesn't matter because this stuff is true, and I want you, you need to experience the joy that I have. You need to experience the breakthrough that I have. You need to experience the freedom that I've got. That's true belief. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7 says that, for we walk by faith and not by sight. So we're going to break that down a little bit. That word to walk in the Greek means to, to conduct my life. It is the way in which I live. In other words, it's as I go in my day, in my walking, in my doing, as I live. So it's not just about walking. It's about this is, this is just how I do things. Have you ever heard people say that? That's just who I am. This is how I do things, right? Well, that's the way Christianity, that's the way our faith ought to be, is that's just the way we do things. How many know that Christianity gets pushed around an awful lot? How many know that out there in the public sector, there's a lot of stuff that gets, that, that gets pushed on us, and, and the Christians stand back and go, oh, 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 right? We got bills being passed right now in the Senate here in Colorado. How many know that we got to stand up and fight against that stuff? We can't just sit silently by. How many know that we've got, we got kids in our own backyard that are suiciding? How many know we got to stand up for that stuff? How many know it's not going to just take more counselors to be able to, to, to push back the pandemic of suicide? It's going to be much more than that. It has to be. It has to be. There has to be a tie to spirituality. Everybody will tell you, I've studied this stuff. Everybody will tell you, counselors, psychologists, psychiatrists, everybody will tell you that there is a spiritual component to this. Even in, down in District 20, and they're trying to bring it up here in the District 38, there's this, there's this pie-shaped thing, and they say, here's all the things that, that, that we need in our life. And one of those things is spirituality. But you ask the people, what are you going to do about this piece? And they tell you, I don't know. Counselors will tell you, yes, they tell me that spirituality is a component to complete healing, but, the, but, I, can't, I, don't, but, but I don't know even how to talk about it. They didn't teach us how to talk about spirituality even in our counseling. They just told us it was a sliver of what needed to happen. How many know it's more than a sliver? How many know it has to be everything that's within us? How many know that's where our communities are going to get set free? How many know that's where the people within where we live around, our neighbors, our friends, our, the people that we go to school with, how many, that's the only way they're going to get set free is by us expressing who God is, his goodness, right? Expressing the How many know that there's a lot of people that need to know the goodness of God? <laughs> he is just awesome. He is so good. He loves us so much, and he desires for us to live life to the full. But so much of the time we miss out on it. So this word to walk means to conduct life or to live life in a way that is just, it's a part of my 24-7. It's what I do. And we need to get that. How many know sometimes we have selective spirituality? I go to my job, right? I was listening to a guy the other day. I was in a meeting and uh, it was so funny because we were talking and, and it's, a, it's a secular group and we were all meeting together and the and the one guy goes, yeah, well, this one thing happened at church and blah, 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 right? And it was, it was kind of a cool conversation. And then all of a sudden, we started getting the business of things. And as we started getting into the business of things, his mouth started flying, right? He goes, oh, I'm sorry. That's my, that's my mechanic side of me. And I'm like, isn't it funny how oftentimes we separate ourselves out into who we are, right? It's, this, is how, this is how we work. This is what I do when I go to church. This is what I do when I'm around certain family members. This is what I do around when I'm around my friends. Anybody? You don't have to lift your hand. It's okay. Because I know we all do it. We're all in that place in a position where we, where, we tend to, where, we, where we tend to live life according to whatever that position. How many know that this needs to be a 24-7 gig? That wherever we're at, whatever we do, that's like, and how many know that there's a lot of people that need to understand the goodness of God in that way? 
And so it's in our walking, it's in our doing. So we walk or we live by faith and not by sight. So we walk or live by faith. This word faith in the Greek means to be fully persuaded. It's God's divine persuasion. That's what this word faith means. God's divine persuasion. In other words, I am so convinced. I, it's that immovable piece of me. In, in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 58, says this. So my dear brothers and sisters, be strong and immovable. Always work enthusiastically for the Lord. For you know that nothing you do for the Lord is ever useless. In other words, I have this confident assurance of who my God is that I am not going to move. I have this confident assurance of what he has spoken into my life. He has divinely persuaded me that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no man comes to the Father but by him. He has, he has divinely persuaded me to be able to live. He's so much persuaded me that it causes me to live this life out. Does that make sense? It's like I'm so convinced that, that you get convinced about something. Anybody ever been right before in this room? A few of you? Okay. <laughs> My wife is always right, so I've learned that. So she <laughs> – so, and it's like – but we, and I'm fully convinced she's always right. So <laughs> happy wife, happy life, right? So, I, so here I am. I, I become fully convinced that what he wants to do in me – that he wants to do it in others. I'm fully convinced that I've been set free, that guess what? You can be set free too. I'm divinely persuaded. That's what faith is. I'm divinely persuaded that, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. I'm divinely persuaded that he is the healer. I'm divinely persuaded that he is the one who sets us free, redeems us, sets us free. I'm divinely persuaded in that. So well, how, how does that work in my life? Well, if I'm divinely persuaded in that, when I see someone who's sick or someone talks about being sick, what do I do? Do I just go, sorry, sorry, you're not feeling good. Anybody? Or do I go, hey, let me pray for you. There's times when I'll be in rooms and it's like, and there's people in this room that do, do the exact same thing. And it's like, and, and where, where someone will say that they're sick and I just don't even ask anymore. It's kind of weird, I guess, but I don't even ask anymore. I just go up and put my hands on him and just go, Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus. Thank you for your divine health and healing in this body right now in Jesus' name. How many know our God's a healer? Guys, he's a healer. He didn't only redeem me and set me free from the curse of the law of sin and death, but he has also become my healer. How many know he's your provision? Whenever you lack and you need something spiritually, emotionally, physically, and even financially, and when you lack something, that guess what? He is your provision. I'm divinely persuaded. He's my provision. So how does that work? When things, when I'm lacking something, there's times emotionally that I'm lacking something. Anybody ever been lacking something emotionally? Anybody ever been in that place of depression? Anybody in that place of discouragement, fear, frustration? And if you've ever been in that place... I have to cry out unto him, don't I? The best thing that I know how to do is that when I get in my truck, I put on worship tunes, and I just worship him. And guess what happens? It starts to lift. I start to get fully persuaded again. God, you got this. Thank you. That your word is true. It says you are the God who makes all things possible. Thank you that your word is true, that when I pray and ask you that you give me the desires of my heart, that the desires that are in me aren't my desires. They're your desires you put here. Therefore, that's why you're going to give me those desires. So thank you for that. Thank you that you're putting that stuff down deep inside of me, and I'm being fully persuaded that that's what you want to do in my life. Thank you. And, and then things begin to shift and change. How many know that when you start walking out in faith, sometimes it can get scary? How many of that when you start walking out in faith, sometimes that's not smooth sailing? I mean, sometimes when you walk out in faith, there's these hiccups in the road. You know, and, and, and Maria and I, we, we get these hiccups, right? We're just like everybody else. We get these hiccups in the road. But we have a choice just like everybody else as well. What are we going to do with this? Are we fully persuaded that what God has spoken to us, that this is what we're supposed to do? Are we fully persuaded? And I'm telling you, if you're not fully persuaded, it's so easily get to get knocked off and to get knocked off track. It's so easily to begin to look with your own visual eyes and not with faith. 
It's so easy to do that. So I'm fully persuaded, and I conduct my life in a way that is fully persuaded. And this word says, for, for, uh, for we believe by believing and not by seeing. By the word, that word not, I thought it was funny because I was going to look up this word not. And I'm thinking to myself, well, not means not. I mean, that would be brilliant, wouldn't it? I mean, and as I'm studying, I'm looking up this word not, and this word not actually means ruling it out as fact. It goes back to the fully persuaded thing. Ruling it out as fact. In other words, hey, listen, there's only one God. There's only one true God. There's not many gods. If you think that there's many gods, there's a place called India, and they have like 90 million of them, so feel free. But here's what I've learned by going to India several times. What I've learned in taking teams into India is that, is that their gods are dead, dead, dead. I am fully persuaded not, right? I rule it out as fact that God is God and there is no other than him. That Jesus is the only way. I ruled it out that Jesus is the only way. He is the only way. I've ruled everything else out because I'm fully persuaded. What about you? See, this is where we get on shaky ground, right, sometimes, right? It's like, well, I mean, I don't always. Be. Listen, if you just get this down, the Bible is true. It's your anchor. Whatever it says, it says. And even if it says things I don't like what it says, it still said it. And therefore, I'm going to believe it. So much in society today, have you watched the politicians today? Oh, my gosh. I am like, Whoa. I'm like, these guys are just insane. And they just, have you seen how they move and massage the word of God around for their own stupid stuff? And I'm just like, you guys are just sick. I'm like, and, and I'm just sitting there going, listen, guys, we have to be fully persuaded that the word is the word. And I can't jump around it. You know what? Like people, this whole LGBTQ, YST, VW, XYZ thing going on, here's the, here's the realities to it. In this church, we will love and value anybody that walks in this church. I don't care if you are a heterosexual and having an affair, and I don't care if you're a lesbian living in a lifestyle of, of, of being gay or homosexual. We will love you. But we will not put up with people walking in the church saying, saying, well, but, but this is the way I am. There's so much connotation scientifically and everything else around it that goes along with what scripture has to say. Too bad, so sad. Because of the fornicator and the homosexual, it's all the same in my book. Sin is a sin is a sin is a sin. And therefore, guess what? We're going to hold you accountable to that, but we're going to love and value you through that. Does that make sense? Did I make myself clear? Why? Because the word is the standard. The word is the barrier. I didn't say it. Scripture says it. Therefore, that's why we stand on it. Here's where people get into trouble within Christianity. is because they, they go, well, I believe everything, but... Well, then, if you're going to start having a lot of buts in there, guess what? There's going to be a lot of things that you're going to start eventually starts moving around and massaging around. How many know that's true? I've got friends who have done that with the Scripture. But when you know it's your anchor, then everything else can go off of it. It holds you to, in place to where you should go and what you should do. That's what I love about Scripture. It's your anchor. And if you hold on to it deeply, if you get it down deep inside of you, you will then not be moved in one direction or another. You will stay steady and stay sure. That's how I become immovable. I can't become immovable without it. So says that we will live by faith and not that we're ruling it out as fact. In other words, this is true, and we will live not by sight. In other words, appearance, fashion, shape, sight. In other words, what is physically seen. And in order to get this point across to understanding why we cannot trust to live by sight, but that we have to live by faith, I want to show you this video. And I want to, this video is, is a video, it's a real short BBC put together this video. And I want to show it to you because I think it, it, it puts together very succinctly, very clearly, why we can't believe 
in what we see. Go ahead with the video. And one of the places they are turning to for inspiration is an ancient and untapped source. Magic Singh is a master of illusion. His livelihood depends on his ability to confuse, trick, and deceive. It's something magicians like him have been doing for millennia. But now scientists want in on the act. Magicians have developed really powerful ways of manipulating what we see. And many of these techniques have been tried and tested in front of live audiences. So by doing so, magicians have sort of developed a very solid understanding of how we see the world. Psychologist Gustav Gunn is well versed in the language of illusion. In a former life, he was a professional magician. Today, he swapped the magic circuit for the science lab. But he's convinced there are some important lessons to be learnt from plundering the magician's book of tricks. Should you take the card out? <laughs> We're not really that interested in the magic tricks per se, but what we focus on is the techniques that magicians use to manipulate your perception. Okay, I'm now going to put the eye tracker on you, so if you could just wear these glasses. In order to find out how these illusions work, Gustav Gunn has developed an eye tracking experiment to enable him to find out what's happening when we watch certain tricks. Now in the vanishing ball illusion, the magician tosses the ball up a couple of times and then on the final throw, he just pretends to toss the ball up in the air. Yet most people actually experience an imaginary ball, leave the hand and then sort of disappear somewhere up there. But when Gustav analyzed his data, he discovered the eyes and the brain told a very different story. Now, the eye tracking data showed us that whilst most people were fooled by, by the illusion, the eyes weren't tricked. So the eyes, rather than actually looking at the imaginary ball, just stayed on the face. And what this showed us is that the illusion really happened in people's minds. What this trick really demonstrates is that rather than seeing what's physically present, the way we see the world is based on our prediction of the world. So we see things that we expect to see. So in this case, we expect the ball to leave the hand, and that's why we actually see the ball, even though physically it's not actually present. When it comes to what we see, the brain often overrules the eyes even constructing events that may not have actually happened. It's an important insight into how our visual system operates in the real world. Now, in the real world, things happen incredibly quickly, and we have to respond at great speed and accuracy to visual information. This information processing may take up to 150 milliseconds, and that kind of delay would just be far too great for us to miss, for example, catching a ball or so. So, rather than just relying on this information, what the visual system does is it predicts what's going to be happening in the future. So, in many ways, what we actually see is what's going to happen in the future rather than in the present. So, seeing may not always be believing. But is our sense of hearing any more reliable? So, I like that. Go and turn those lights back on. So I like that because it really begins to talk about how many times, many times you're prepared to see what you see and the illusion happens only in your mind. So you think you see something, but it actually happens in your mind. I love what they said here. It says, the way that you see the world is based on the prediction of the way you, of the way you see the world. In other words, I predict I will see it this way. Therefore, that's the way I see it. If you walk in fear, how many know that when you walk in fear, it's the way you're predicting something will happen. Therefore, what happens? Something fearful takes place. 
when I, when I, and so when I take this according to the word of God, then it begins, when I start putting the word in me, then it begins to be differently. I like it, it says, it says, we see the things we expect to see. What do you expect to see? What do you expect? And many times, that's why oftentimes, because of the hurt that we've had from the church, anybody ever been hurt from the church before? Okay. Marie and I have been there, done it, bought the t-shirt on that. We've had burnouts on our head and everything. It's really cool. I mean, we've thrown it on the bus, everything by the church, right? And so we've been there in regards to the things of the church. And so therefore, if I'm not careful, I will expect that to happen again. Why? Because the church just does that. It's not until I change my thinking on that, then will I actually get healed on that to realize that that's really not the way the church really is. Does that make sense? But it's by, by what I expect to see happen. Then it says, when it comes to what we see, the brain often overrules the eyes. Did you get that? When it comes to what we see, the brain often overrules the eyes, even constructing events that may not have even happened. The brain does that. The brain does, overrules the eyes. So what does this mean? It means, it means we really need to change about what we think, doesn't it? It means I need to change about what I really do see. But I saw it. Well, just like the pictures that I showed you earlier. Yeah, you, everybody saw something a little bit different, didn't they? Yeah, but I saw that. I know I saw that. It doesn't matter about what you see. It matters about the faith or what you believe, that faith in action. That's what matters. Because each of us in this room will see things differently. Ever been in a conversation? Things get heated in a conversation. When you pull away, one person saw it this way and another person saw it that way. Therefore, that's why there was conflict. Am I right? So what does that mean for us, for those that walk in faith? It means that I've got to pull away. Marie and I have this thing that we do with each other and we do it with other people. And it's, and it's a statement that, that we say to one another and we say it about other people. And that is, I choose to believe the good. I choose to believe the better. I choose to believe, right? Why? Because my eyes may be what? May be fooling me. And, and how many know that in this room here, as family, in this room, family is what? Messy. And family being messy, how many know that many times when things get messy, we all want to run away? How many know that it's in the middle of the mess that we can actually concrete our relationships with each other if we will choose to walk through it with one another and choose to battle through it and go, let's get here, right? Because if we choose to believe the best in one another, how many know we can get there? But if I choose not to believe the best in one another, how many know we won't get there? Why? Because I saw it. I felt it. How many know your feelings are the same way as you're seeing? How many know everybody in this room, we could be in the same middle of the same conversation, and, and many people will, see, will feel something differently in the middle of that conversation? And so what has to give? What, what, what has to happen? Well, our faith has to become sight. Not our sight becoming faith. Does that make sense? So our faith has to become sight. And how here, how's that happen? In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3, it says, By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. What's that say? The things that were seen were not made out of things that were visible. But our faith has to become sight. Our faith, if I believe in something, eventually it comes to pass. It, it'll actually happen. And it'll become concrete. It'll become something that I, tangible that I can hold on to. That's what we're going for. So how do I get there? What does that look like? Well, when you believe the word of God, soon your faith will see. If I put enough of the word of God in me, my faith will finally see. I will finally see what God sees. I will finally hear what he hears. When, my, when I got enough word in me, my faith will be boosted when I have enough word in me, and therefore I will see what he sees. How many know that's important? How many know it's important to get on God's page? Too many of us are trying to be on our own page, aren't we? 
Well, I've got my own choices. Yeah, you do. Absolutely, you do. But how many know you have a choice to be on his page or you have a choice to be on your page? And I choose to be on his page because when I'm on his page, I see what he sees. I begin to hear what he hears. And how many know that's a whole lot better than what I see and what I hear? <laughs> Would you agree? And so it says, and this is the other thing we have to understand about seeing and sight. The enemy is the great illusionist. And if he can get us to think like he thinks, then we will do like he does. The enemy is the great illusionist. He is tricking our minds to think that we saw something that we didn't see. Right? Because remember in that experiment, the eyes saw the truth. The mind tricked the eyes and said, you saw something different. How many know that's the way the enemy wants to come in? He wants to come in through our brains. He wants to come in through our stinking thinking. He wants to come in through, through a way because he, he creates patterns. How does he create patterns? Something negative happens to you in life, and then guess what? It eventually will happen again and again and again, and it creates this pattern. And when these patterns are created, the enemy creates these patterns. And it's not until I break the pattern that this stuff will, will disappear. But I have to be the one to break the pattern. I have to be the one to say, man, I'm not going to believe what he believes anymore. I'm not going to see what he sees. I'm going to see the word of God. Oh, there it says right there, impossible things are possible. Yeah, but no, impossible things are possible. Yeah, but impossible things are possible. Yeah, but no, the word of God says impossible things are possible. And this situation that's in front of me right now is impossible. Therefore, I know that it will be possible. Why? Because I am fully persuaded it to be true. Why? Because his word said so. Remember, it's my anchor. And if I don't deviate off my anchor, how many know that I can truly believe it's true? It gets my brain, right? It's the renewing of the mind. Why, why does Paul talk about that in Romans? To renew the mind. Why? Because if we renew the mind, we'll begin to think like God thinks. And we'll get rid of the stinking thinking. We'll break down the barriers of how we used to think. And we'll push that away. And then you're going, but, but it happens to me all the time. So what? Do you want it keep happening to you all the time? That's a choice we have. But I don't have that choice because life just happens to me. Really? How many know that many of us live life in such a secular manner? We believe that life just happens to us. Anybody? I've, I've, I've done that. There's plenty of times I've done that where I just feel like, man, it just keeps happening. There's nothing I can do about it. I feel helpless. I feel out of control. It's just the way life is. Life just, anybody have, life just dealt me a hand of cards. Anybody? How many know that's not true? God dealt you the same type of faith. Every one of us was given a measure of faith. Hear that noise upstairs? That's what I call amazing right there. Around, We love it. So we got to get to a place where we're like going, man, we, I've got to change my brain. I got to change the way I think. I want to think like God thinks. I want to see like he, think, like he sees. I want, I, I want to do it the way he does it. Anybody? And if we will change that, then all of a sudden we'll begin to walk in a freedom that we have never been able to walk in. So this is why. The foundational piece of this is getting the word of God down deep inside of us. Romans 10, 17 says this. So faith cometh by hearing and hearing the good news of Jesus Christ. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing of the word of God. That's how faith comes. So that's why people <laughs> get it. This is not just something that's in a Bible, you know. <laughs> And then and I, I get a kick out of this. Some of like, man, that was really great, man. Faith comes by hearing. But how am I supposed to hear it? Well, you, you have the Bible app, and it has, like, it has, like, these little speaker things next to each of the translations. So you can pick, like, any translation you want. It's, like, amazing, right? And you can just click that button, and while you're driving down the road, it, and it will just talk to you. You can actually literally hear it now. Right? It used to be that I would have to put the word in front of me, and I would, how many know that's one thing to read it and one thing to hear it? So it's always a good thing when you're reading the word, read it out loud. It's amazing. Have you ever taken the Psalms? I dare you, double dog dare you to do this. Take the Psalms and begin to pray the Psalms of your life out loud. 
double dog dare you. Oh my gosh, it is awesome. You begin to, because you, it gets down inside you, you begin to start praying it over your life. And how many know things start to happen? It's the weirdest thing, guys. But the Bible is true. It, it, it's crazy. It says it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It's, it's active and it's alive and it's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing between the soul and the spirit, even the thoughts and the intents of the heart. It's true. It does it. And all of a sudden, the word gets in me, and as the word gets in me, it's like something's changing. How many know, sometimes when I get the word in me, I don't see anything for like six months. And then all of a sudden, something shifts. How many know, sometimes it's not immediate. But I keep getting it in me. I keep getting it in me, and it keeps shifting me. How many know, from, from 20 years ago today, I've changed. Because the word's gotten in me, and it shifts me. And so when people want to come up to me and go, yeah, but you can't, yeah, but, yeah, but, right? And they say stupid stuff. I just sit there and go, yeah, but nothing. It's like the word is the word and it's true and it's active and alive and powerful in my life. I don't know what the words you're talking about because it's working in me. How many know that's sharing God's goodness? And people are like, how many know some people get really frustrated? Well, I listen to the, I listen to scriptures like all week long. I did it for a week. And nothing happened. Listen, this is not hocus pocus. This is not some sort of magic trick. This is not, this is like, this is, do you believe what the word is teaching you? And if not, just keep listening. Eventually it'll get down deep inside you and you'll be like, you know what? I, th- I actually believe this stuff. This stuff is actually true. Wow, look at, it actually shifted my, it, look at my kids. Look at my, things are changing. Things are shifting around me. This is amazing. And then one day you wake up and go, I don't, I don't know what happened. I don't, listen, I know what happened. You got the word in you. Because when we get the word in us, it does that thing. So we do not live according to what we see, but we live by what we do not see. And I'm telling you, this faith thing can be very, very tricky at times. But I take a look at some examples in the Bible. Marie and I were talking about this the other day. And it's like, take a look at these examples in the Bible. How about Noah? Anybody? No, really, think about Noah. He's in a desert. Hasn't rained like forever. And God tells him to build a stinking boat. I mean, this is not like a mythical thing that happened. This is true story, true life thing that actually happened, right? It's historical. This actually happened. This one guy chose to live by faith, not by what he saw. And God, I'm encouraging you, God wants that in your life. He wants you to begin, because there's, how many know there's, he didn't, God didn't ask Noah to build a dinghy. The thing was pretty massive. And then Noah starts talking about, yeah, well, you know, I'm going to build this, like, this massive boat and everything, and, like, we're going to, like, have two of every creature on it, okay? Could you imagine what people would have thought? Two, oh, really, two of every creature. Yeah, two of every creature. It's going to be amazing. Really, two of every, yeah, two of every creature. How's that going to happen? I don't know. But that's what was spoken in my heart. Listen, guys. How many know that God's not expecting you to go out and build a boat? That's what he asked Noah to do. But how many know he's asked you to do something? And I don't know what that is. And sometimes it can seem as big of a boat to you, right? Stepping out in faith sometimes can seem like, man, God asked you to build a boat. Sometimes it's like, yeah, but you don't understand. And it could be relationship stuff. It could be work stuff. It could be, right, whatever it is. It could be, it could be where you're supposed to live. It could be all sorts of crazy stuff, right? But how many know that God, right? How about Abraham? No, I need you to go over there. But why? Just go over there. How many know that took some guts to be able to do that? <laughs> Didn't it? I mean, yeah, I'd say some, but anyway, it that that was gutsy. That was just gutsy right there. You know what I'm saying? And I'm just sitting there going, "Wow!" Everything was comfy. His whole household, his whole family, everything was just good. Now nah, I go over there. Why? Because God was setting himself up for something better, wasn't he? See, the problem is, we try to count on everything that we see. Can you imagine if Abraham counted on everything that he saw? 
then God wouldn't have been able to speak to him that one day, one night, and go, can you look up at the stars? Your descendants are going to be like that. But because he was so assured, fully persuaded of who God was, he knew that was going to happen. How many know Abraham, it says in Hebrews, it was credited him as under righteousness that he believed, even as unto death, he still believed that that would happen. I'm talking to you, man. That's gutsy right there. How about Daniel? <laughs> but God, that food looks really good over there. I mean, they're eating steak and all sorts of cool stuff. I mean, it's the king's food. I mean, and he wants me to look good, and I want to look good for the king too because I want to have favor. How many know that would be eyes that we see? What Daniel do? Nah, just give me some veggies. I'm thinking to myself, that ain't right, right? <laughs> no, we, we do that every the beginning of the year, every year here at Fuel Church. We do, we do this prayer and fasting, right? And it's like we're eating veggies and all sorts of stuff. Man, how many of you guys are thankful for when the, you're right? I mean, I'm thankful for the fast and all that kind of stuff. I, I'm getting good stuff out. But I'm also thankful for when it ends because I like the meat, right? Well, it's like, could you imagine Daniel? I mean, he's like, no, just, just, just trust me on this one. And, and, and guess what? He ended up better off than all the others, didn't he? Because he did it God's way, not man's way. And so many times we're trying to do it man's way, and I'm telling you, don't do it. How about Peter? Right? How many know that took some guts for Peter to step out of the boat and walk on that water? Hey, Lord, if it be you, call me. Come on out. And Peter walks out there. Now we... We smash Peter all the time for taking his eyes off of Jesus and starting to sink in the water. But I'm telling you, who else got out of that stinking boat? And I'm telling you that our God, he is such like a father that he's not just God. He's like a father to us. And he loved it that Peter actually stepped out of the boat. He loved it that, people, that Peter, when he took his eyes off, Jesus reached down. And I could just see Jesus. Couldn't you see Jesus just chuckling? Right? He took his eyes off and Jesus was like, come on, Peter. Come on. Get up. You know, where's your faith? Right? That's the way I see it happening. And we're because he's such a good dad. And he, he he loves the fact that we took the risk. When my kids fall off the bike, I love it that they actually tried getting on the bike in the first place. I don't yell at them because they fell. I get them back up, brush their knees off, and get them going again. That's our God. He loves you that much. So why don't we try this faith thing out? And really get out there and go, okay, good Lord, what do you want me to do? How do you want me to walk this faith journey out with you? What does that look like? Hey, listen, I just want you to get some word in you this week. Great. How do you want me to do that? Man, if you have a drive, I'm telling you, the Bible app is amazing. Plug it in. Turn it on. Spotify has a lot of great worship stuff out there. We have some worship lists from Fuel Church that's on there. Look it up. Plug it in. Worship. Right? Get that in you. He also may be going, hey, listen, I need you to go talk to your neighbor. What? How many know that there's different ways to go talk to your neighbor? How many know there's one way to go talk to your neighbor and go, neighbor, you need Jesus? That's one way you can talk to your neighbor. How many know it's not necessarily the most effective way to talk to your neighbor? How about this? Hey, neighbor, how's the things going? Oh, my gosh, a conversation actually happened. It's, it's going all right. Let him tell you their story. Can I pray with you? Simple, right? Or don't even do that. Oh, don't get too scared on me. How about neighbor? How's it going? Anything I can help you out with? How about if I go to shovel your drive when the snowstorm comes this next week? Do you see what I'm saying? How many know this? When I serve, I serve like Jesus. And it gives me, what it does, it allows me the opportunity to be in someone's life that I can actually speak the word into them in the future. When God allows me the opportunity to do that. How many know I don't have to do it on the first get-go? Hello. In fact, around here, we don't talk about the E word, which is evangelism. We don't talk about E. We don't talk about doing the E thing around here. You know what we talk around here? We talk about sharing God's goodness with somebody. What do, you, what do you mean? Well, what's God done? What good has he done in your life? I was listening to a preacher the other day, and he says what he does, he oftentimes carries a $100 bill around with him. And when the Lord leads him, he walks up to somebody and says, so I really feel like I'm supposed to give this to you, and the only reason why I'm giving this to you is because I used to be down on my luck, just like you were down on your luck. And I'm giving this to you right now because I want you to know that he loves you that much, that he cares about the situation you're in right now. 
How many know that's a great way to share a little bit of Jesus with somebody? Share the goodness of God with somebody in a very practical way. Let's don't try to do this E thing where it's like, <coughs> right? Let's just love on people for crying out loud. One of the, the, the things that we talk about here around Field Church is love and value people all the time. Hopefully when you walked in this room this morning, you felt loved and you felt valued. And it's not a charade. It's because we want people to know that Jesus loves them. How many know that this community out here, it's not going to get changed by thumping on their heads? How many know that this community out here is going to get changed because each and every one of us in the room, individually in this room, are loving and valued people that are around us each and every day? So I want us to be those people that stand up and stand in faith. So I want us to get into the word. How many say amen? I want us to be those that, are, that seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. How many say amen? And I want, us to be, I want us to be those ones that see what he sees, that our spiritual eyes will see what he sees, so our, our eyes will see it before it even happens. I love having those eyes. It drives other people crazy because how many know that sometimes when you have those eyes, you see something five or ten years down the line that they don't see? How many know when you look with those eyes and you love and value people, you can even see what other, you can even look at somebody and see what they don't even see in them? How many think that's awesome? And then you can speak that into them. I, I, here's what I see in you. I see courage. I see boldness. I see grace. I see freedom. I see, right? And they're like, what? I don't have any of that. I know, but you will. Because I'm seeing something you're not seeing. How many of that's valuable? Anybody have kids in the room? Anybody seen things in your kids that they don't see in themselves? How many know that that just doesn't apply to your kids? How many of that applies to people that are around you that you begin to see in them what they don't even see in themselves? I tell you, man, when you start speaking that into people, I've seen it happen more than once, man. Tears just start to flow. Things just, and all of a sudden, the crushing of the heart, the tenderness of the heart happens, and they're like, oh, man, thank you. I've been needing that. So I want to encourage each and every one of us as we leave out of this room today that we're those that walk in faith and not by sight. That we are finally allow our faith finally to become sight because we finally are starting to see what God sees even before it happens. I want us to be those type of people that when we walk out of here that we'll be an encouragement to those that are around us. Why? Because that's what's going to draw people to Jesus. How many, how many know that this community needs Jesus? We pray for this community all the time and i'm just believing god for some sort of crash through breakthrough revival something happening right here in our own backyard i'm ready for stuff to happen so crashing so breaking that that the country begins to look around and go what in the world has happened legislation gets changed things just get flip-flopped on its head why because god comes crashing in comes in like a flood and begins to love and value people that they're going man i just got to do it god's way i don't care what anybody else says I'm a teacher, but I don't care what anybody, I'm a this, I don't care what anybody else says. I'm a that, I don't care what anybody else says. I'm going to do what God's asked me to do. Amen? Stand to your feet with me this morning. Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus, and this morning we choose to see what you see. We choose to hear what you hear. Our desire, God, is to not to be... Um, allow the enemy to come in and be the great illusionist in our life. We're done with that. Our desire, God, is to be able to really look forward to having eyes of faith. And then when others come in and they're like, yeah, but what about, and what about this, and what about that, and, you know, such, such and such happened to this person, and such and such happened. Listen, I don't care about any of that. All I know is what I know, and what I know is that my God is true, my God is love. My God loves me. He has a plan for my life and that he makes impossible things possible. And God, this morning as a, as a church, we stand here with you and just go, we want to see this happen. We want to see this community changed. We want to see our own lives changed. We want to see our own families changed. We want to be able to, we want to see kids come back home to you we want to we want to see relationships mended we want to god we, we we want that we 
So God, we only know that's going to happen. It just seems impossible sometimes when I take a look at the relationships that are busted and broken, and it seems almost impossible to mend. But God, I know that you're a God who mends things. I know that you're a God who can make that happen. Difficulties that are going on at work or things that are going on at the school and things that are happening in, in my room at night by myself and, and it just seems like things come crowding in. God, I know that you're a God of impossibilities and that you can rip away depression and fear and doubt. That you can come in and rip away lust and discouragement. And that the enemy tries to come in and steal, kill, and destroy and says, well, it's got to happen again. It's got to happen again because it always happens this way. It's a pattern. That God, I pray that this morning that we will be those people that will stand up on your word and say the pattern as of today is broken in Jesus' name. That we refuse to go back on the pattern. We refuse to go, Here, here's the cycle again. Here's the cycle again. Here, God, we refuse to go on that cycle again and again and again. We refuse it in the name of Jesus. And that God, that you would just renew our minds, that we would be fully convinced of who you are. We'll be fully convinced of what you want to do. We'll be fully convinced this morning. Because God, we don't want to walk out of here today just kind of floundering, but God, we want to be fully convinced. If you're saying here this morning with me, and you're like going, Pastor Dan, I, I, I just, I don't want to go around and around in circles again. I don't want to see these patterns happening over and over again. I, I'm done with these patterns. and I, I want to break this pattern, and I'm done with it. If you're saying that, and you're like going, you know, I choose to believe the word of God. I choose to believe the impossible things because my God is the God of impossibilities. If you're saying with me this morning, man, Pastor Dan, I, I'm here and I just, I just want to, I want to walk by faith and not by sight. I want to, I want to walk out of the realms of sight and I want to see what God sees. I want to hear what God hears and I want to see it before it actually happens. And if you're in that position with me this morning, just lift your hands up. Father, we come before you with our hands lifted up as a sign of surrender all across this room to say, God, we desire to walk by faith and not by sight. That even this week that you would show us how to walk by faith in with our neighbor. You show us how to walk by faith with our kids. You show us how to walk by faith with our relatives. You show us how to walk by faith as our family. We show us how to walk by faith with my boss. You show me how to walk by faith at the gas station. You show me how to walk by faith wherever I'm at that I would, it's a 24-7 fully convinced lifestyle. God, that's what I desire. That's what I want. And God, I thank you that you are a gracious God, kind, tender. And that whenever we fall off the bike, that you just brush our knees off and get us back on again and say, great job, way to move forward. That we will not become discouraged, frustrated, irritated about those kind of things, but God, rather that we would be fully convinced and rather that we would get back up again and that we would ride again with a smile on our face and then until we get this thing. So God, I just ask that you would help us, you would challenge us during the week this week that this message just doesn't fall on deaf ears, but this message, Father God, goes deep down, seated down deep in our hearts and that we would be able to walk this thing out and that we would say, wow, that was really cool this, way, this week. I was able to do this in faith and I was able to do that in faith. And that, God, you get us to a place where this truly becomes a 24-7 thing for us. Father, we love you. Thank you for an awesome day today, and I thank you for what you're doing in each and every one of our lives. And we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. So today, don't forget to...